Hello, my name is Dr. Jeremy Petrovich, Developmental Editor for Current Protocols at Wiley. It is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Thomas M. Ashurst of the Sydney Cytometry Facility located at the University of Sydney. Dr. Ashurst is a recognized high-dimensional cytometry specialist whose research has been focused on analyzing cellular infiltration in the virally infected central nervous system and understanding how the hemopoietic system is reorganized in the bone marrow to change cellular output in response to infection. To do this, he utilizes high-dimensional cytometry systems, such as mass cytometry and 29-parameter next-generation fluorescent cytometry, as well as high-dimensional imaging systems, such as imaging mass cytometry, to interrogate cellular systems in a range of disease context. To aid in analysis, he applies and improves existing computational analysis tools, in addition to developing his own novel algorithms for analyzing high-dimensional data sets. With that, I turn the webinar over to Dr. Asher's for his talk titled, Mapping Dynamic Immunity Over Time, Space, and Disease Using High-Dimensional Spectra, Mass, and Imaging Mass Cytometry Technologies and Analysis. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is about the process uh, by which we can map uh, the immune system in a dynamic way, the way the immune system deals with uh, threats to our health in a uh, sort of real-time capacity. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, I am from uh, Australia, which uh, you can see down here on this uh, little plot. Um, I uh, work with the Sydney Cytometry Facility, uh, which is a facility which is designed to be able to bring high dimensional technologies, high dimensional single cell technologies, and put these in the hands of our users. Uh, this is a joint venture between two separate institutes. Um, the University of Sydney uh, and the Centenary Institute, uh, which share this role. Uh, and the idea here is to bring not just one form of technology um, to be available to our users, but multiple different kinds of technology. So here is uh, the team that we are able to work with, uh, a collection of uh, colorful individuals. Uh, and the technologies that we offer are all designed around single cell measurements of one form or another. This might be in high dimensional fluorescence technologies, uh, in imaging microscopy, and obviously in cell sorting. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we also established the Ramachiotti Facility for Human Systems Biology, which helped us bring in mass cytometry uh, into our collection of uh, technologies, which kind of rounded out uh, the spectrum. Uh, here are the teams involved, um, and in particular, uh, Adrian, uh, Dr. Adrian Smith and Professor Nicholas King here uh, are the directors of the facility. And they've really spent uh, the last few, few years trying to build up our capacity uh, in terms of what we're able to offer our users. Uh, and then in partnership with uh, Professor Fazekas here, uh, have been uh, able to round this out with our mass cytometry technologies. Um, along with the, uh, the cytometry uh, facility team, uh, the other group uh, that I represent here is uh, a team which uh, Professor King and I put together with a number of individuals from uh, computer science and the School of IT at the University of Sydney. And the idea here was not just to bring expertise in immunology and cytometry technologies, but to bring uh, expertise in uh, machine, machine learning and computer science so that way we have uh, methods that we can use to approach the kinds of data sets we generate using our high dimensional technologies. Uh, one of the greatest challenges we find as we go through the process of using these technologies and generating data is that once we have the data, trying to draw meaningful, meaningful conclusions uh, becomes the greatest challenge. This becomes the greatest area of difficulty. So reaching out to our colleagues in computer science and machine learning uh, allow us to think about the data in innovative ways and to come up with solutions that can help us address uh, the problems that we're trying to investigate. Now, the key uh, concepts that I want to discuss today as part of this talk is that the immune response is a dynamic process uh, and dynamic at the single cell level across time, across uh, space, space and tissues and across diseases. Now, if we consider this in sort of a schematic view, um, you can think of the immune system uh, as something like this. Uh, in this little distribution here, uh, you can imagine this would be representative of, of a person or a mouse. You have a range of different tissues that are all interconnected uh, with each other. Uh, in each of these tissues, you have a range of different cell types which might be present. Uh, these cell types can either be uh, fairly generic, many immune cells can exist in both the blood and lymph tissues and the bone marrow, but in each of these sites they have 
uh, sort of specialization which dictates their behavior and their function. Uh, then you can then go to other tissues like the brain, which contain microglia. And these are highly specialized resonance cells in the brain. And they have very highly specialized functions that are particular to the brain. And these cells don't exist uh, elsewhere outside of the uh, nervous system. Now, if uh, you perturb the system somehow, you're able to uh, interfere with the way that the system operates. Now, in the uh, laboratory of uh, Professor Nicholas King, um, over many years, have shown that if you infect uh, the central nervous system with uh, a virus, and uh, historically we've mainly used uh, West Nile virus, but other viruses like Zika virus behave in a very similar fashion. If you introduce virus into the brain, not only do you get the infection of cells uh, locally with this virus, but you also get local immune responses. Microglia in the brain will respond to the presence of virus, you then get signaling uh, between the brain and peripheral tissues, such as the lymph nodes, uh, and then you get further signaling cascades to the peripheral immune system. Uh, this results in, uh, I guess, what we'd call broadly immune mobilization, that is mobilization of the immune system uh, to respond uh, to this viral threat. Uh, what this looks like in encephalitis in particular is we get expansion of a number of immune cells in the periphery, and then eventually we get migration of some of these cells into the central nervous system. Uh, these cells can go in there and can try and uh, effectively kill the virus through the production of toxic mediators. Uh, but obviously this process is reasonably complicated. The brain uh, is a fixed area of tissue. Uh, having cells coming in producing toxic uh, compounds is actually going to be very bad for the health of the neurons there. Uh, and this, in fact, uh, in the work uh, from Nick's lab uh, is primarily responsible for pathology in these models. It is the immune response to the virus that becomes overactive, uh, and this is actually what causes death uh, in experimental infected mice. Uh, so this is the sort of immunopathology axis, where the immune system is responsible for the damage here. And in other papers from the King Lab uh, over the years have shown that if you use various methods of interfering with the way that these cells infiltrate into the brain, you can actually prevent much of the pathology uh, and death that's seen in these models. Now, one of the areas that I care about uh, in particular in uh, my work and the work from my PhD is about the bone marrow. Uh, most of the immune cells that infiltrate into the brain are inflammatory monocyte-derived macrophages, and these cells originate in the bone marrow. Now, if we just think about the bone marrow in sort of a uh, schematic sense, uh, you start with the stem cell, the cell, a hematopoietic stem cell. This cell has the ability to become any kind of cell, uh, any kind of blood cell in the body. And very uh, crudely drawn here, this cell can differentiate down one of a number of lineages. Uh, it isn't quite uh, a split decision as I sort of draw it out here. This is more a spectrum uh, of differentiation, but uh, for diagrammatic purposes, this seems suitable. It can commit to either a myeloid or, or a lymphoid or erythroid lineage. Uh, and then these, uh, this commit these committed cells go through a, a expansive intermediate phase where they proliferate highly. And then these proliferating cells go on to mature into the subsets that we know. This happens for uh, B cells in the lymphoid arm. It happens for uh, neutrophils and other granulocytes, uh, as well as monocytes. Um, and then other cells, such as uh, early T cells and things. Now, one of the key things here is that it is this intermediate section where most of the proliferation happens and most of the expansion happens in the lineages. So this is the area where the activity occurs in terms of inflammatory changes to hematopoiesis. Now, it's also the most difficult area to analyze. If we think about what differentiation looks like in terms of the proteins we can track uh, on or within cells, uh, stem cells are actually reasonably well defined based on the protein markers uh, that we can find on them. So these have a fairly well defined phenotype. Uh, as these cells mature, they lose many of these stem cell markers and gain a variety of maturation markers. Uh, and these are all very familiar uh, markers that we might be looking for on the cell surface. But these intermediate cells, these highly proliferative cells, exist right in the middle. Uh, these cells are much more difficult to analyze because we don't have um, a, full, uh, a full idea of exactly what phenotypes of cells exist here. And so as a result, these cells are uh, the most difficult to analyze. Now, uh, 
when we have inflammation as a result of something like encephalitis, this becomes even more complicated because not only do we have uh, this sort of complex metapoietic spectrum uh, with these intermediates with ill-defined profiles, we actually have signaling events that modify what happens during hematopoiesis. So for instance, uh, cells from the brain or other tissues will release cytokines into the blood. These cytokines will suppress the proliferation of some lineages allowing for the expansion of other lineages. And so we see, for example, that some, some of the B cell and granulocyte lineages, we get a reduction in proliferation and we get expansion in some lineages, uh, such as the monocyte lineage. And so not only do, is this a difficult system to, to interpret uh, in the normal situation, in inflammation, this becomes even more complicated. So what I'd like to review about this system and how we approach it uh, in these experimental models, um, I'd like to talk about the current single cell technologies that we have available to us and the way that we can apply them. I'd like to talk about the way that we go about mapping this dynamic immune process, specifically in the context of viral encephalitis. And then I'd like to briefly discuss how I think uh, the areas that I think we need to go in the future as the field evolves. So first of all, um, a little look at the different single cell technologies we have available to us and how uh, we are best to apply these uh, to our experimental models. Now, at the moment, there are three broad areas that we have for doing high dimensional single cell analysis. Uh, the first is flow and, uh, and spectral cytometry, which, get, which use uh, fluorescent molecules attached to antibodies that we use to be able to label cells. <clears throat> they can label proteins on the surface or within the cell. Uh, we have mass cytometry, which allows us to do, use larger panels by using metal conjugated uh, antibodies that we label ourselves with. Uh, and this is analyzed in a mass spec style system. And then we have our single cell RNA sequencing uh, style approaches, which allow us to measure uh, many, many genes per cell, whole transcriptomes, uh, but uh, in, a, in a different kind of way. Um, uh, we're also able to integrate antibody-based measurements uh, into this using oligonucleotide conjugated antibodies, which the cells can be labeled with, uh, which give uh, large panels, but in a more uh, cell-limited context. Now, in terms of uh, fluorescence cytometry, this has evolved uh, significantly over the years as the technology has kind of improved and expanded. Uh, one of our platforms that we uh, have used over the last few years is our 10 laser system. Uh, which is which is uh, essentially a system which allows us to excite any kind of fluorophore that we might have available, whether that's part of a large panel or using fluorescent proteins. I suppose the idea is fundamentally whatever kind of fluorophore we might want to use, we're able to harness it in this system. And so this system allows us to our high dimensional uh, fluorescence uh, work, which allows us to acquire uh, cells very quickly. Uh, and we've had uh, a lot of fun evolving this over the years. Um, and, but this, this type of technology has been uh, evolving for some, some time, and there's now uh, numerous papers showing panels that uh, are able to develop um, panels of up to 20, 25 and above uh, colors in, in single panels. Uh, a lot of this started with uh, a talk from uh, Dr. Pratip uh, Chattopadhyay at uh, CITO in 2014, uh, showing one of the world's uh, first panels that was above 18 colors on uh, their experimental system at the time. Uh, and now there are a number of papers out there demonstrating this technology, uh, including one of ours. Uh, very recently, um, Dr. Helen McGuire and I were able to publish a book on mass cytometry protocols, uh, which is out now. Uh, and in, in this book, we really tried to capture kind of the maturity of the field uh, that is mass cytometry in bringing together what, what are stable and established protocols uh, used by mass cytometry laboratories around the world. Uh, and this really captures a lot of uh, the sort of fundamentals of what uh, I'm discussing today in terms of our protocols. But uh, whilst we have a kind of development and evolution and maturity in flow cytometry, we also now have the same uh, sort of thing in mass cytometry. Uh, and finally, uh, particularly recently with the evolution of projects like the Human Cell Atlas, we've seen uh, a huge scaling of uh, focus and attention towards uh, single cell RNA sequencing technologies, uh, and in particular, a focus on kind of being able to compare these different technologies and see uh, which is best suited to what kind of application. Uh, and some of, those, some of these have been uh, summarized in some excellent papers over the last couple of years. Um, 
one of the key differences in this technology that's uh, evolved in the last few years is the ability to simultaneously profile um, trans transcripts or the whole transcriptome on single cells along the side protein measurements uh, using uh, either SiteSeq or ABSEQ uh, technology, which fundamentally uses an oligonucleotide of some form conjugated to an antibody. So that way, when you sequence the RNA of each cell, you can sequence the oligonucleotide as well. You get a measurement of the RNA inside each cell along with the protein. And this is very helpful for us um, and for uh, researchers to be able to sort of start to merge the kinds of data that you get from RNA-seq uh, with our mass and flow cytometry data. Uh, there is even out there some single cell proteomic uh, work being done. Uh, this is a little bit more on the sort of developmental edge, uh, but we always like to keep an eye on this because we find it very interesting. Uh, the idea of uh, doing proteomics, not using antibody reporters like we do with mass cytometry, but genuine single cell proteomic measurements. Uh, but this is at a rate which is uh, probably not uh, compatible with a lot of studies at the moment, and it's not at a commercial level, uh, but we're sort of watching uh, with eager anticipation to see how this evolves over the next few years. Now, when we think about these technologies together, they each play a different role. So uh, the way we like to think of it is in these four kind of uh, buckets. We have our flow cytometry, which we've discussed. This allows us to do uh, reasonable size panels with very, very, very many cells uh, per experiment. We have our mass cytometry panels, which uh, allows us to do larger panels, um, but with fewer cells per experiment. We then have single cell sequencing, which again allows for larger panels, whole transcriptomes, but on fewer cells. And then something like the single cell proteomics approach, uh, which again is much, much fewer cells, but potentially uh, very large uh, measurements, uh, very large number of measurements per experiment. Uh, and we can think of these technologies and how they fit together with something like uh, this radar plot. Um, there's a number of attributes to each of these technologies which sort of allow us to think about how they're, how they're used. Uh, we can start with the number of things we're able to measure uh, per experiment and how, how unbiased or how targeted these uh, assays are. Uh, we can think a little bit about um, the uh, kinds of things that are measured. Is it protein? Is it uh, are these epitopes, are these, is this RNA, uh, or is this epigenetic? Uh, we also then have uh, things like sort of extensions of the technology. We can think about uh, how does this scale to imaging? Uh, do we have the ability to sort? What is, what is uh, the capacity for this to extend to other modalities? Uh, and then there's some more sort of fundamental stuff. Uh, what's the throughput like? What's the economy like? How, how much per cell will the experiment cost? And then fundamentally fundamentally for users, there's a question of ease. Is it easy to uh, use the technology? What's the ease of entry like for this particular technology? And if we plot each of that, these technologies on here, uh, we get this very sort of rough patterning. Uh, where we get to see how these technologies compare to each other. Now, this is all not to scale uh, at all, but flow cytometry has this kind of uh, expansion on this side where we get a high throughput ability to sort. Uh, it's a very economic technology and very and quite easy entry. Uh, but obviously, there's less uh, on this side where we're talking about unbiased approaches, the different kinds of measurements that can be made, and the number of features. So this is a very high throughput, very effective technology, but obviously is limited uh, to, uh, I suppose, in ma most cases, less than 30 uh, features being measured in a single panel. When we move to mass cytometry, we see this line starts to shift. Uh, it can be lower throughput. It doesn't have the ability to sort. Uh, there can be uh, more barriers to entry because it is a newer technology, but we expand on the number of things that we're able to measure and the number of features we can measure in a single experiment. As we move then through to things like single cell RNA sequencing, this shifts again over towards the right hand side. This becomes more difficult, less economic, but we're able to measure many more things per cell. Uh, and then just for good measure, I've added uh, an extra line here for this proteomic uh, cytometry as well. And so what this reveals is that these technologies have, uh, have a relationship. They all fill a slightly different part of this kind of use case. Uh, going from higher throughput, more economic, um, all the way through to sort of uh, higher, uh, higher number of features and a more unbiased approach. And so being able to effectively think about how these technologies fit together and where they're best used, used allows us to harness these uh, for their maximum potential.
Uh, and just for uh, some simplicity, because this slide has a kind of a lot going on, a way to really distill this down is maybe just to summarize it like this. Uh, going from, uh, in this case, left to right, we're going from, from measuring many things per cell in an unbiased fashion with the sort of single cell proteomic or RNA technologies, uh, and this is sort of decreasing as we move across to the right. And so, you know, naturally you would think measuring more things per cell would be better. However, this comes uh, at the cost of uh, actual cost as well as throughput. So as we move across to the right, not only do we, uh, de we not only decrease the number of things we're measuring per cell, but we're increasing the throughput and dropping the cost per cell. Uh, and this is kind of the key axis that we talk about. It's how many things we're trying to measure per cell uh, and how much is it going to cost us in terms of time and money. Uh, and then fundamentally, the last kind of aspect here that we like to think about is um, obviously uh, only one of these gives us the ability to sort live cells. And so using these technologies together means that we can combine this power uh, in a way which is pretty meaningful. Uh, and just to make a brief comment on the cell sorting, uh, this ends up being quite important when we can do uh, sorting in a high dimensional kind of way. Um, some time ago, uh, Dr. Suat Dervish uh, worked in our facility and helped develop uh, a protocol for eight-way sorting. <clears throat> this allowed us, uh, allowed us to take our high dimensional panels and use them in a cell sorting capacity, which, which in our case actually matters. When we're looking at the hematopoietic lineage, not only do we need to use the protein information per cell to kind of give us an idea of what's happening in the system, but the ability to actually pick out eight populations from that data set to sort them and to see what they look like on a cytologic level gives us a lot of confidence that what we're seeing is real and is sort of, uh, I suppose, rooted in uh, old school hematology, not just some population that we can see in the data that we infer should be a certain kind of progenitor. So it, I think being able to translate between these high dimensional technologies in an effective way uh, really matters. Um, and just a final point on how we think about these technologies together is that being able to consider them as one complete whole uh, actually makes a huge uh, difference. And in a few talks from uh, Rob Salomon recently, he, he uh, sort of you know, started using the term of genomic cytometry, trying to encourage uh, cytometrists to think of something like single cell sequencing, not as a different technology that has nothing to do with what we do, but when we think about it, it is another form of performing single cell measurement. And so what we try to do is to uh, take the blinders off in a way and think about these all as different single cell uh, technologies that allow us to do our work, uh, which is really important. Now, there's a, uh, a slight deviation here when we talk about these technologies into how well these adapt to spatial analysis. Uh, and this actually matters quite a bit, uh, as you'll see in just a moment when we talk about uh, the way we apply this in encephalitis, that spatial analysis makes a huge difference for the way we try to interpret what's happening uh, at the immunological level. Now, uh, there's been two technologies uh, in uh, in the sort of mass cytometry sphere that have been developed recently. Uh, the first is uh, IMC, imaging mass cytometry, which is what I'll be talking about today, uh, with, which is uh, with Fluidime. Uh, and there's also the uh, multiplexed ion beam imaging uh, with ion path, uh, which uh, we, we don't have one of these, so we're only discussing IMC. Uh, and there's also some alternative technologies uh, which, has been, which have been developed in the spatial area based on RNA sequencing. Uh, so this allows for sort of spatial transcriptomics uh, to be performed. Uh, and at the moment, these aren't, ex uh, these aren't exceptionally high resolution. Many of these are sort of hundreds of micron uh, kind of scale, but some more recent studies uh, have been uh, developing this down to cellular level uh, spatial transcriptomics, which is really quite exciting. Now, the, the uh, platform that we have here at Sydney Cytometry is the Hyperion uh, Imaging Mass Cytometry System. Uh, and just because this is a little bit newer, I thought I might just briefly outline how the technology works. Uh, when we have something like an experimental model, we have uh, a mouse where we might extract tissues. Uh, in a normal site off kind of experiment, we'd, we'd take these tissues, process them into a single cell suspension, and then these cells can be labeled with antibodies conjugated to various heavy metals. Uh, we take what is roughly the same process um, but we, instead of processing the tissues into single cell suspensions, we can embed them uh, in paraffin or freeze them uh, in some kind of media. 
and then label these tissue sections uh, after they've been cut with the same antibodies we use for mass cytometry. Now, there are some important differences in the clones of antibodies we use in this process, but fundamentally, it's the same idea. Rather than taking a suspension of single cells and labeling them, we're measuring a tissue section. So rather than destroying the tissue architecture in the microenvironments, which might be important, we're keeping these intact so that we can see where these cells exist in the architecture of the tissue and in their own microenvironments, which we'll, uh, we'll see is very important shortly. Uh, this system can be then, uh, sorry, this, this sample can then be uh, put into an ablation chamber where a high power UV laser can ablate small sections of the tissue. This will release whatever is inside the tissue as well as the, uh, the metals that we've introduced using our antibody labeling. Uh, and then this can then uh, be uh, taken into the site off uh, and measured using essentially the same process that's used uh, for suspension mass cytometry being measured in a time of flight uh, system. Now, the reason that uh, this is uh, effective is because the laser ablation spot size on the tissue is actually quite small in the order of about one micron. And so if we think about what this looks like uh, at kind of a high power level, uh, here's a little color Im image that we can use just as an example. We fire one shot of the laser down at the tissue section this will ablate about one micron squared of tissue. Uh, and then the material from that one micron uh, squared spot will fly up and be taken into the side off for measurement. Once we've measured that, we can ablate the uh, spot next to it. Tissue from there, uh, the, the material from there will go into the side off. Then we can ablate the next spot uh, and the next spot. And we can basically do this until we have rastered the entire area of tissue that we want to image. Uh, and all of this happens uh, automatically, so this is all very hands-off. We don't need to touch it ourselves, uh, which is very helpful. Now, when, what this looks like when we're actually uh, imaging uh, is something like this. Um, now, as you can see, uh, the crosshairs are uh, 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 a spot on the tissue where the laser is firing and we're looking down at a tissue section within the, hyper within the Hyperion itself. And you can see that the crosshairs are moving from left to right as it's firing the laser down at the tissue and ablating small bits of tissue at about 200 shots per second. Uh, it moves to the right, gets to the edge of the area we've asked it to image, it moves to the left, goes down a level and then ablates a new line of cells. What this allows us to do uh, over time is uh, obviously ablate areas of tissue that we're interested in, but it, this is all automated. So we can let this run uh, while we're off doing other work or potentially even overnight. All right, so now I wanna talk about how these technologies get applied uh, in our studies specifically. And this is trying, what we're trying to do here is to map dynamic immunity in the context of viral encephalitis. So this is all done uh, in mouse models in the, King, in the laboratory of Professor Nicholas King. And fundamentally what this boils down to is we have mice that we inoculate with virus. And in this case, we're using uh, West Nile virus uh, or Zika virus. And these can be inoculated either using an intranasal model uh, where olfactory neurons get infected with the virus, the virus then moves into the brain, or this can be through intracranial infection. And six to seven days later, uh, the mice reach the peak of their disease and in our full dose uh, model, this is 100% uh, lethal. And so all of these mice will come uh, to the encephalitic disease. Uh, in this case, we can extract various tissues. Uh, for us, we're mainly focusing on central nervous system, which is the brain, uh, as well as things like bone marrow or lymph tissue. Uh, these cells uh, can either then be uh, separated out uh, into a suspension or we can embed these in paraffin or in a frozen media uh, of some kind for imaging. Uh, these cells can be labeled with our antibodies and then analyzed using uh, flow or mass cytometry. Uh, the kinds of panels that we use uh, depend somewhat on the kind of tissue that we're analyzing. Uh, when we're looking at uh, hematopoietic tissues, for instance, uh, we have panels that incorporate largely immune uh, markers, uh, but not necessarily only immune markers. Sometimes we're interested in analyzing what's going on in terms of the hematopoietic uh, and cell cycle system as well. So for instance, if we look at the bone marrow, uh, what we have is the ability to incorporate uh, a compound called BRDU or IDU. Uh, this is essentially something that will be taken into cells during S phase. And so a cell that incorporates um, 
BRDU or IDU is actively uh, cycling, essentially. Uh, this can be done. Sorry about that. I pulled out my microphone. Um, this can be done essentially either using uh, an injection of BRDU or IDU into the mouse before we take these tissues, or this can be done after the fact. We can take the cells out of something like the, uh, the bone marrow, put them in a tube, put the BRDU or the IDU with it and incubate it for an amount of time. Uh, and then the, uh, the book that I just showed before, uh, we have some examples of how we're able to effectively uh, tailor this assay so that we can do these cell cycle measurements. Now, what this allows us to do is generate uh, a whole lot of data using some pretty significant panels. And these panels allow us to measure all kinds of things that we might be interested in. Fundamentally, we start with hematopoietic uh, level things. This includes kind of a wide variety of broad lineage markers, as well as things for uh, viability. Uh, we can then focus in on some more specific lineage markers, uh, lymphoid markers, T, B cells, and K cells, things like this. Uh, we can also then look at uh, the myeloid lineage, focusing more on macrophages, granulocytes, these kinds of things. Uh, but importantly, we, we can also have a particular focus uh, on, uh, on functional markers, markers that indicate something about how the cell is behaving uh, in the inflammatory context in which we're investigating it. Uh, but we also then have things like cell cycle markers to have a look at how the hematopoietic system is changing as a result uh, in response to inflammation. Which is, which is critical. The way that we analyze this now uh, requires some finesse. Uh, the data sets we end up generating using this process can be uh, very large and very complicated. Um, and uh, essentially what we need to do is take better approaches to data analysis than we have previously. Um, many groups, uh, ourselves included, spend most of our time doing sort of manual gating, which allows us to identify subsets that we know because we are immunologists. Uh, but over time, uh, the field has been able to start incorporating uh, approaches to data analysis that allow us to use uh, what we might call unbiased methods, uh, things like clustering, dimensionality reduction. Uh, and without going into too much detail, because we'll see what that looks like specifically, the way we do this now is with our own um, R package, which we call SPECTRE, uh, which allows us to incorporate a wide variety of different computational analysis tools into one sort of cohesive integrated uh, package. So this is how we do our analysis these days. Uh, this is a tool I developed, uh, particularly with uh, Giovanna uh, Putri and uh, Dr. Felix Marsh Wakefield from, uh, our, so from our institute here. Uh, but just as to sort of put this in a broader context, uh, we haven't done necessarily anything particularly new here. There's a number of papers out there describing very similar either tools or packages, uh, which allow for workflows of um, of analysis that can be tailored to these kinds of experiments. We've just put this together in a very particular way that allows us to do very large data sets uh, at, at a reasonably high speed. Uh, in particular, we have uh, a number of workflows that we sort of integrate into our package here. Uh, and the main one that we use is we just call our discovery workflow, which is essentially for uh, analyzing uh, samples where we don't exactly know what subsets we're trying to investigate. We don't exactly know what these might look like. Uh, and so it's kind of an open platform for approaching novel data sets. Uh, but sometimes we don't want to just be doing things uh, with kind of no idea of what's coming out the other end. Sometimes we might want to perform what we call broadly a replicative analysis, where we're trying to replicate a type of analysis across multiple samples or other kind of deep profiling uh, types of analysis. Uh, but then there's other more specialized things, sort of batch alignment or data integration, time series analysis, and things like this. Now, what this looks like <clears throat> broadly in terms of the analytical workflow is we need to take um, our data sets and we need to be able to, first of all, uh, mix these together and do some pre-processing. Now, the pre-processing is largely about preparing the data for our analytical, profi uh, our analytical profiling. Once we have this data prepared, we can do some clustering. Now, a lot of these workflows start with a dimensionality reduction step using something like TISNI or UMAP, uh, but these um, have problems with scalability in terms of how they can adapt to large data sets, whereas clustering using something like FlowSum uh, will scale very well to large data sets. So we start uh, with FlowSum, 
Uh, we can then do some uh, dimensionality reduction using something like Tizany or UMAP. Once we've run this dimensionality reduction, we're able to separate out these samples to see how they compare to each other. Um, and that's a really important part of obviously this experimental workflow is we're comparing how different samples uh, work. But we do have some limitations. Uh, whereas something like FlowSum will scale very well to large data sets, it's maybe tens of millions. We've done, I think, up to 40 or 50 million cells in a single experiment so far. So this step is uh, pretty compatible with large data sets and it operates very fast. However, things like TISNI or UMAP have some significant limitations. These don't necessarily scale all that well. And this isn't just a computational time problem. Uh, obviously, the larger the data set, the longer the calculations take um, <clears throat> to be able to effectively run these tools. However, this isn't the only limitation. There is actually a sort of uh, a, a non-scalability here. The more cells we try to run in any given TISNI or UMAP plot, the more crowded, the more sort of convoluted the plot gets. And so we end up with a functional limit of how many cells we're able to incorporate uh, in this kind of plot. So the way that we get around this currently is we're able to run the flow sum on the initial data set, which gives us a large data set, perform some downsampling, and then use the downsample data set for plotting. Now, when we look at these plots and we figure out, okay, you know, cluster one is microglia and cluster two is macrophages, even though this data set is um, subsampled or downsampled from the original one, we know that cluster one and cluster two in the FlowSum data set are the very same cells. So when we go to create our summary data, we go to do our cell counts and our frequencies. This comes from the very large data set, which gives us more, more robustness when we're doing our statistical analysis. And this then allows us to create our graph cell heat maps from a more significant uh, size data set. And so what this does is give us a sort of practical, real-world way of getting around uh, these size limitations, which for us is very helpful. And so this is all uh, part of that sort of spectre workflow that I talked about, but this can be reproduced in uh, pretty much any tool that's out there at the moment. So when we look at the brain of uh, mice that have been infected with West Nile virus using this approach, uh, this is what we find. Fundamentally, when we look at uh, normal mouse brains, we're only expecting uh, leukocytes in the range of about 100, 100 to 200,000 cells per brain. Following infection, this number increases about tenfold. Uh, and so we're getting sort of millions of white blood cells per brain. Now, in a normal brain, we're expecting almost all of the white blood cells to be microglia. These are resident uh, cells that live in the brain permanently and protect against pathology and neurodegeneration. However, once we have introduced the virus into the brain, seven days after infection, we get a huge influx of cells that come into the brain from the blood. Uh, and the vast majority of these are inflammatory macrophages, monocyte-derived macrophages, as well as a number of other cell types. Uh, once we have profiled these and we're able to figure out what clusters represent what uh, using that flow sum approach, we can then uh, quantify these specifically. Now, the macrophage subsets are obviously the largest uh, component of this infiltrate, uh, sort of numbering in the in the millions. Uh, but then we also have significant um, contributions from lymphocyte subsets as well as our neutrophils. Um, now, this this uh, this constitution is actually very important because we hypothesize that if we were able to tip this balance, we have fewer macrophages coming into the brain, we might be able to change the nature of the pathology uh, in this disease. Now, interestingly, if we look at something like Zika virus encephalitis, uh, we actually have a very similar pattern of infiltration where we get significant infiltration of sort of inflammatory macrophages uh, compared to other subsets. And in a paper we've published recently with doc Dr. Marcus Hoffer, um, uh, we were able to show uh, that if you interfere with uh, the immune system here using sort of knockout approaches, you can change what kinds of cells infiltrate into the brain uh, using, uh, in this case, an interferon alpha receptor knockout uh, mouse uh, in a study here led by Amina. So this has kind of, I suppose, translatable concepts that go across viral diseases. So even though Zika virus is uh, a distinct virus, it's, it's not the same thing as West Nile virus, it is in the same family of flaviviruses. And so when we look uh, at these different viruses, they have very similar patterns of immune response uh, 
Uh, and so once once we know that, once we understand that, we can take lessons from one viral model and start to try to apply them in another to get a better idea of what's happening uh, in the disease model itself. Now, when we turn to the bone marrow, um, we need to uh, first think about what the system in the normal mouse looks like. Uh, and essentially what this looks like is something like this. Uh, in a hematopoietic system, uh, in the bone marrow in normal mice, about half the cells that we find, half the hematopoietic cells are red blood cells, uh, and this large cluster here. And then we have a, you know, a range of different uh, white blood cells that are present as well, which we can profile uh, using this kind of an approach. Uh, now, this uh, system changes dramatically uh, during infection. Uh, we can see this both in terms of the profile and the types of cells that are present in the bone marrow, but also in the cell cycle uh, status of most of, these, uh, most of these cells. Now, without going into uh, too much of the sort of granular detail of this, essentially what we see is that if we look at just these, these heat map examples, as we go from mock or normal infected mice, um, we see a pretty dramatic changes over time as the infection starts to take over, uh, going from sort of early on day one through to day seven. Uh, early in the infection, not much is happening, but as we go to day three, to day five, to day six, to day seven, we start to see a kind of a, a ramping up of this uh, response. And fundamentally, what this boils down to is that we get a dramatic expansion of the monocyte lineage and activation of these cells. Uh, this is in, in preparation for them expanding, maturing, and then immigrating out into the blood and then out into the brain, which is where they become that inflammatory macrophage subset that we know causes pathology. And this happens at the expense of some other lineages that actually are suppressed in the bone marrow to allow this to happen. Now, when we think about what happens in the brain, importantly, it's not just as simple as what cells turn up or not. When we have a look uh, inside the normal brain, for instance, this is a, a cryosection of a normal mouse brain. Uh, we see very few cells and the cells that are present, uh, which are a little small here in red, are the resonant microglia. So these cells are supposed to be there. When we look at the brain after seven days of, of infection, obviously we have virally infected cells here and these are neurons, but we also have these red CD11B positive cells. And these are the infiltrating cells that have come in from the blood. And if we looked across the whole brain, uh, we get patterns where we see uh, a distribution of normal microglia uh, all across the brain in the normal mouse. Uh, but then we also get um, brains with high levels of cellular infiltration, as well as uh, areas of infection. Now, this is really important because if we want to be able to image this entire area, uh, we need to think about the kind of way, uh, the kind of way that we're going to approach this and the kind of technology that we're going to use. Now, if we're thinking about applying uh, imaging mass cytometry, <clears throat> this is a very powerful technology that allows to do a lot uh, of markers, uh, analyze a lot of markers on one tissue section. However, when we think about this pragmatically, we need to take a few things into consideration. If, for instance, we were going to image a mouse lymph node, uh, these things are pretty small. And so this is actually not going to take a whole lot of time to image, maybe in the order of something like four hours to image a mouse lymph node. But if we think about what it would take to image an entire mouse brain, um, this is actually going to be significantly larger. Uh, mouse brains, though small, are a significant area in terms of this scale of technology. Um, this is going to take something like a couple of hundred hours to image an entire mouse brain. So this is potentially not the best approach uh, in terms of uh, doing this work. However, there are more strategic approaches that we can take here. If, for instance, we start by using uh, microscopy, maybe some kind of fluorescence assay, we can look at a very sort of uh, low kind of power way. Uh, we can look across the brain, find where our infectious foci are and where our areas of cellular infiltration are. Um, and we can do this with very few markers, two or three markers uh, at a time. Once we know where our areas of interest are, we can then target them more specifically uh, and then image these areas using many, many more markers, using larger panels, uh, using imaging mass cytometry. Uh, and this is key. What this allows us to do is to figure out the areas that actually matter using a low power approach and then focus in on these areas for a targeted high impact uh, kind of analysis using imaging mass cytometry. Now, when we look at the brain uh, and what happens there using uh, imaging mass cytometry, uh, we get to see some pretty cool stuff. Uh, and this is some uh, work that uh, I've done with uh, Alana Spiteri, who's another uh, PhD student in Nick's lab. Um, the normal brain has uh, is quite, I would, I would say, quite pretty actually to look at. Uh, 
Um, we get, obviously, uh, stretches of neurons running through the brain, which we can label using various uh, neuronal markers. Uh, but it's not just neurons present in the brain. There's a bunch of cells that are either structural or immune in nature, which allow for the kind of continued health of the brain. And in this case, we have our astrocytes in green, as well as microglia in red. Now, one of the key things that we are interested in, obviously, uh, in encephalitis is what kinds of cells become infected um, during this process. Now, when we're only able to measure a couple of markers at a time, we can only really assess uh, whether uh, a particular cell is infected by the virus. But what we'd like to be able to do, obviously, is measure all of the cells at the same time and figure out which of them become infected by this virus. Uh, and something that we can do with IMC, for instance, is look at uh, the staining, in this case of NS1, which is a viral protein, and see what kind of cell it associates with. We see in this case that NS1 associates highly with uh, new N, which is a uh, neur neuronal nu uh, nuclei marker. And we can see that these two uh, correlate very highly. So we're seeing infected neurons in this case. Whereas if we try to look at NS1 staining uh, correlating with C11B, which marks microglia, um, we don't really see the same kind of association. So we're not getting infected microglia, even if we are getting microglia near uh, these cells. Um, near these infected cells. And likewise with astrocytes, we, we see astrocytes near virally infected neurons, but we don't see infection of astrocytes. And so the, the infectivity here is very specific uh, to neurons and not to other cell types. If we think a little bit more about the immune infiltrate, um, we can look at areas of the brain here, and this is an area of the mouse hippocampus. Uh, in blue here, we have DNA. In green, uh, we have uh, Lysic C. Uh, in red, we have C11B, and in light blue here, we have NS1. Essentially, what we can see is that this line of neurons here uh, are all infected um, with the virus and expressing this NS1 protein. And then in this area down here, we're getting the infiltration of C11B positive, Lysic C positive immune cells. So these are these infiltrating myeloid cells that are coming in to fight the virus. Now, what we can do here is change the way we think about this a little bit. Uh, to investigate exactly what cells are coming into this area to fight the virus and how they're different from, say, immune cells elsewhere um, in, the, in the tissue section. Now, if we think about what this looks like, is we need to be able to take an image and turn it into a bunch of cells. So in this case, what we need to do is perform, at a very simple level, segmentation. So we basically draw a boundary around each cell um, in an automated way so that we can understand what markers are expressed on that cell in total. We can then perform clustering or dimensionality reduction approaches to figure out what sorts of subsets we have, ask questions about how these subsets relate to each other, and then how this kind of distribution uh, works out in uh, our various infection infected or mock infected mice. Uh, and a lot of this has been kind of uh, spelled out in, good de in pretty decent detail uh, in this paper describing Histocat, which is a tool from uh, the Bowden Miller Lab which is developed by uh, Dr. Dennis Shapiro. Now, if we take this approach, um, one of the fundamental limitations that we have here is in how we do segmentation. Segmentation is essentially an approach where we want to say, OK, well, this cell over here is one type of cell, and this cell next to it is a different type of cell. However, we do have some significant problems here. This overlap between two cell types actually is, is fundamentally going to prevent us from doing this properly. Um, this overlap is sometimes just because cells get a bit smooshed together, but fundamentally this happens because when we think about a tissue section, it's not entirely 2D. Uh, most tissue sections uh, in either um, formal and fixed paraffin embedded sections or in frozen sections are something like 5 to 7 microns thick. And so if we take what this 2D image looks like and we sort of flip it up and look at what's happening uh, in the Z axis, we might have cells that are physically overlapping in that three-dimensional space. And so when we look at them in 2D, they have this appearance of overlapping. Now, this problem means that we don't actually ever have perfect segmentation. Uh, we have, in this case, the red cell contains some of the green signal, and uh, the green cell contains some of the red signal. So we don't have perfect segmentation here because we just can't get that from our images. Now, different, techno different technologies and different analysis, analysis approaches will try and approach this differently. Uh, some technologies, um, such as uh, the SURAT workflow for spatial transcriptomics, do this on a probability basis. They figure out probability scores for each cell and what it, what it's, what it is 
most likely to be rather than just taking these protein profiles at face value or in their case, RNA profiles at face value. Um, some other approaches such as the codex system use a process of spatial compensation, which tries to adjust for the overlap in these cells. Uh, but nonetheless, whether we try to adjust for this overlap or not, we're still able to get single cell data out of our images, uh, which is important. Um, and most recently in our, in our SPECTRE system, we've uh, added some capacity to do um, uh, spatial analysis using IMC data. And essentially what this allows us to do is to say, uh, integrate a cell boundary, which in this image here is indicated by these yellow lines. Um, the white coloration underneath it is our our actual image, which has come off the uh, off the Hyperion itself, and so this in this case is showing levels of CE45, and then these little dot points in the middle of each of these cells here are colored by the average level of expression uh, of that marker on that cell. So once we have these data points, we're able to do something a little bit more uh, comprehensive. So we can then look at that same image. And in this case now, we're looking at the data points of each cell. So this is uh, each cell's expression of mu n. So we can see this kind of long stretch of neurons along the hippocampus here. Uh, we can then also look at the presence of cells that have uh, viral infection in NS1 standing here, so this long st stretch of neurons, and then cells that are infiltrating that express uh, C11b, so these infiltrating myeloid cells. Now, when we want to look at these in a little bit more detail, we can do our high dimensional profiling as we would for suspension cells, but we're now doing this on, uh, on our spatial data. So this is a Tisney plot showing uh, cells that have been clustered using FlowSOM, and we can map these clustered subsets back onto this, onto this spatial plot, and we can now start to figure out what subsets are present in what different areas of the tissue. So we know, for instance, some of these clusters that show up uh, in the areas where immune cells are infiltrating into areas of infection have very distinct profiles compared to myeloid cells that exist elsewhere. So what we can start to do here is start to ask questions about how the presence of virus in the neighborhood that these cells find each other, uh, find themselves, how the presence of virus dictates the behavior and the phenotype of these cells, uh, which gives us the ability to start asking these questions at a spatial level. And just as a little example here, um, when Alana tried to profile how microglia change over time in the brain, what we find is that in the normal brain, they have kind of a, uh, a classic uh, sort of spindly arm sort of profile. Uh, and this is very typical of microglia. As we progress over time, however, uh, we find that these cells start to become uh, activated. They start to become more responsive to the presence of virus, uh, obviously progressing from day zero where they're normal uh, to day seven where they're more highly active in response to encephalitis. Now this obviously happens in concert with the expansion of viral infection in the brain uh, as this NS1 signal starts to permeate through the neuronal systems in the brain uh, which becomes substantial uh, over seven days. And so what we're able to do here is not only visually and phenotypically uh, visualize these changes but we're able to quantify and track these changes using the segmentation approach, uh, which gives us a very powerful way to merge the sort of suspension approaches that we take in sight of uh, with the imaging approaches in IMC. Now, what I would like to finish on is just a couple of, uh, a couple of thoughts about where this sort of field needs to go. So we have some very, uh, some very good ways of doing analysis of suspension data from sight or from flow as well as some imaging data, but we need to go further in terms of the way that we can integrate and apply these, uh, these analytical approaches. Um, one of the key areas that I think uh, is important is in the way that we integrate time series data. Um, one of the things that we do currently in clustering approaches is that we basically take the whole data set as a complete whole. We break it up into different clusters and then see how those clusters change between samples. But we don't effectively integrate any time based data into that approach. Um, recently, we published a paper on, uh, on a tool that we developed, which we call Chronoclust, which was specifically designed to track uh, changes over time using clustering that incorporates time as another parameter. Um, the reason that this is important is because if we look at, just as an example here, the mock versus infected bone marrow, you can see shifts in populations that appear uh, on these plots, but the shifts aren't always uh, going to appear in a way that is dependent on time. So for instance, in this case, we have two populations here in the mock infected group. In the West Nile infected group, what we see is a kind of an increase in this 
almost intermediate group. And so this doesn't appear to be something which should be happening in a time dependent fashion. Uh, but we actually do know that this is time dependent. These cells are moving backwards on the plot, as it were, rather than forward. And so this, this kind of analysis doesn't allow us to see how these changes appear over time. So what we wanted to do is develop an approach that allowed us to integrate time into this approach. Uh, so what we created was a tool called uh, Chronoclost, which we've now published. Uh, and fundamentally what this allows us to do is we can take our starting data set, so our day zero data set of any, uh, any experiment, uh, and we run some clustering to figure out what cells are there. Then what we do is we integrate uh, the subsequent day, so in this case, uh, day one, and we can see how the cells in the new data set compare to these cells in the seed data set. If they're similar enough to an existing cluster, then they just get incorporated into that cluster. If they have changed somehow over time, then they become new clusters that are branched from the old ones. And essentially we repeat this process for every subsequent day, integrating the, the data from, uh, from new days uh, until we get a time series dependent uh, uh, analysis, which is, I think, a very important thing uh, to consider because these processes are, by their very nature, dynamic over time. They're driven uh, by an infection which expands and progresses over time, and so the actual response to that infection changes over time. One of the other aspects that we need to consider is how we integrate this kind of data set at a, uh, these kinds of data sets at a higher level. Uh, an example of where this is being uh, applied at the moment is in projects like the Human Cell Atlas, which importantly tries to take the concept of having a, an atlas of every cell type in, say, the human uh, or the mouse, uh, so that you have a reference database that you can use to figure out what cells you're looking at in any given experiment. Um, now, what this depends on is our ability to effectively map data sets between different technologies. Uh, a lot of work is being done on this, and this is an example from an approach used during uh, in SURAT, uh, which is a common single cell RNA-seq analysis tool. Essentially, the approach here is to take different single cell seq data sets and to be able to align them in such a way that you can transfer labels between them. So if you know in your reference data set that you have a certain bunch of T cells and B cells and uh, monocytes, et cetera, if you can align that original data set with a new data set, you can effectively create a situation where you can transfer labels between them so that way your data set uh, in the new experiment that you've run can be automatically labeled and annotated with those cell types. Uh, and this is important not just for, I suppose, the speed at which we can do these experiments, but in relating the new data we generate to existing uh, established data, which is important for reproducibility. One of the ways that this can be done at the moment is using uh, a batch alignment approach uh, called Cytonorm. And this is developed by uh, Sophie Van uh, Garson in Yvonne Size Lab. Essentially what you can do is take um, two separate uh, batches or uh, almost two separate uh, experiments really of uh, data using the same panel. If you can figure out the how these two experiments or batches relate to each other in terms of how the markers are shifting. Usually this is due to some kind of technical variance. You know, you stain, you stain samples on one day, uh, you get a certain kind of profile. You stain similar samples on another day, it's slightly warmer, you stain for slightly longer, and you know, the marker expression patterns change a little bit. So what you can do is essentially take these two different data sets, figure out the cluster relationships between them, and run a process to align these data sets so that rather than having two separate batches uh, where you get different clusters on, in this case, a UMAP plot, you can align these data sets so that all the cells overline uh, in a way where they can be analyzed in a single process. Now, what this looks like importantly is uh, a process of figuring out how these differences look. Um, once you've got this aligned data set, what you can essentially do is look at the original data, which you may have already analyzed, you may have already annotated, so we know what cell types are present. Um, and you can compare the new data against that. So for instance, if we look at this new data set uh, in the top panel here, for every cell that we have uh, in the data set, we can basically ask which cell in the labeled data set is it most similar to uh, using something like uh, a K nearest neighbor classifier. Once we know what cell type it's closest to, we can transfer uh, the label from the labeled data set onto that new data set. 
So in this case, we might decide that this cell uh, belongs to a particular group. Maybe in this case, it's, it, it's, it's classified as a T cell, and so it can then take that label. Uh, we can then move to the second cell, and we can figure out what, what uh, cell it's most similar to in the labeled data set. Uh, in this case, it would be a different cell type. Once we figure out what its closest neighbor is, we can then give it a label. Maybe in this case, it's a B cell, and we basically repeat this for the entire, for the entire data set. And just to give an idea of how this works, the way that a K nearest neighbor works in this case is you take a cell uh, and you look at basically what, what other cell in the data set is it most similar to. And with K nearest neighbor, essentially you can say, well, I, I want to compare it to that. I'm going to give it the label of the cell, of the single cell that it's most cl closest to. So a K of one. So in this case, if we take our new cell, we look at its closest neighbor, we find that its closest neighbor is a neutrophil. And so we apply that label to that cell. If we then take another cell, we look at its in initial nearest neighbor. We find maybe that's most similar to an NK cell. And so it gets the NK cell label. And we essentially repeat this process for uh, as many cells as we have in a data set. Uh, this isn't entirely, this isn't like absolutely robust to any kind of variance. Obviously in inflammation, a lot of things change about the profile of these cells, but what this allows us to do is to take an initial data set, which maybe is normal uh, mouse tissues, maybe is inflammatory mouse tissues, and we use this to figure out a prediction of what new cell, uh, what, what population these new cells uh, should belong to, uh, which is important for how we take this into the future. Um, if we run this on actual data, just to kind of give an example of what this looks like, is we have our original labels, uh, in this case uh, derived from flow song clustering. Uh, this is just an example of bone marrow. If we run the classifier on, a, on uh, the remainder of this data set, uh, we end up with very similar labels. Um, this is pretty accurate for the most part. There are some areas of this plot where uh, a few cells may be misidentified, uh, but for the most part, this is a pretty accurate process. So this allows us to take um, very complex data to classify it in a way based on existing data sets, um, which helps not only with figuring out what populations are present in new data sets or in new batches, uh, but also in uh, essentially trying to scale up these analysis to very large data sets, which is pretty important. So that's all, uh, that's all I have uh, for the talk. Um, I'd like to obviously just thank um, the team that I get to work with. Uh, fundamentally, these groups are uh, who I spend most of my time with, and in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Nick and Adrian, who allow me to do a lot of this work and support it uh, within the facility. Uh, and Nick, who I did my PhD with, where all of the encephalitis work came from, uh, and uh, Mark, um, Mark, who I, I run this uh, kind of developmental team with, uh, is a huge help. And uh, Giovanna and Felix uh, work with me on developing the Spectre package, and so I owe them a huge amount of thanks. Uh, and our work is funded largely by the NHMRC, uh, but also through the Mary Boucher Institute here at the university. Uh, so that's uh, that's all I've got, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashurst. That was an incredibly engaging talk. Thank so you. one of the first questions we have is, what are the greatest challenges in applying suspension type computational analysis to imaging data? Yeah, I think um, it's not not a uh, not a trivial question to answer. I think one of the key things is uh, I mentioned it briefly before, but there is a limitation in how we uh, approach spatial data based on segmentation uh, in suspension data, so in flow or in sight off. Uh, each cell is by definition on its own. Each cell is analyzed one at a time, so there is no kind of or well, at least very little confusion about whether signal from one cell can contaminate another. In spatial data, that changes fundamentally. So for instance, if we have a situation where we're looking at immune cells infiltrating an area of viral infection, if we have overlap of cells, then we may see virally infected macrophages in, the, in, the, in this system. Now we know that these macrophages don't become specifically infected, but they're going to gain a different profile if we use clustering or dimensionality reduction because now these cells have a little bit of viral signal. So the way that we approach it and the way we think about the data has to change a little bit. We can't just say, well, it's positive for virus, therefore it's virally infected, or therefore it's a different cell. We have to kind of, I suppose, integrate a level of probability to the way we think about these cell types. Or we have to think about the way that we can correct for these signal overlaps. So it, it's not just as straightforward. I think we'd like it to be straightforward, like, well, 
we just turn the image into single cells and then we analyze it, it's actually a little bit more uh, complicated than that. But I think with a shift in the way we think about it, um, that'll help significantly. Uh, but ultimately, a shift in the way that we actually correct for these overlap artifacts will be key. Thank you. So you did touch on it the last part of your talk, but what do you, any further thoughts on what is the future for computational analysis and cytometry and how could the existing tools and approaches be improved upon? I think the, where a lot of this kind of work needs to go, I think is in the sort of capacity that uh, I suppose the, the goals of, of things like the human cell atlas, rather than uh, each experiment having to be analyzed independently or sort of clustered and visualized independently, uh, what we'd like to be able to do is take that sort of batch alignment type approach, which uh, I touched on before, to be able to integrate data sets over time. And so if we have, for instance, a, let's say, a reference map of immune cells, you can take a new data set, which is generated using off or Flow or whatever, integrate that into the existing data set and do that kind of label transfer. So I think what that allows us to do is take, take advantage of machine learning approaches that mean we can rather than rather than just run each experiment independently, we can run a reference data set experiment, have it extremely well annotated, align uh, new data sets with that original reference data set, and then do that kind of label transfer. Because I think what that allows us to do is not only, I suppose, reduce the workload almost um, of having to run these experiments independently, but I think it will actually help with reproducibility because then we have something which is well known. Uh, to compare each of these samples against. And so whether it's from an inflammatory model or from just profiling normal tissues, uh, we've got something which is stable and well profiled to compare against. And I think ultimately that helps us scale up, so to speak, either in terms of the just size of the data, but also the kinds of complexity that we're trying to, uh, I suppose, trying to appreciate in these disease models. So kind of following to that, why does it matter that we examine these kinds of immunological systems at the single cell level? Yeah, I think I think it's very important that we do this kind of thing at the single cell level. Um, obviously, in medical research, uh, one of the, I suppose, uh, key things that's been done over time is bulk measurement, where you can take, uh, you take, you know, cells from a particular tissue, but you're not analyzing the individual cells, you're just analyzing the sort of the, mo the mush that's created of, um, uh, you know, taking all those cells together. And so you might, for instance, in the blood, look at the level of cytokine in the blood, which is a very fair thing to do, looking at cytokine and serum. Uh, but if you can look at the production of cytokine by each individual cell, then you're able to look at something a little bit more functional, a little bit more deterministic. For instance, we know in the bone marrow, uh, if you look broadly, uh, you, you, you don't really see uh, the kind of subtle changes to the metaportic lineages that you do see if you do it at the single cell level. At the single cell level, what we can see is that the whole hematopoietic system is reorganized in such a way that it favors the production of particular cell types uh, to go and combat the viral infection. Whereas doing this at a bulk level, you may see clues that this is happening based on, say, the cytokine profiles that are present, but you can't mechanistically figure out what's happening uh, in terms of what is being changed and potentially why. If we know, I suppose, at that kind of level, what cell types are changing and what's responsible for disease, then we can target these much more specifically. Um, and I mean, this can be fairly significant. You can have very low frequency cell types responsible for great changes in either uh, pathology or immunity. Uh, you know, regulatory T cells are a great example of a very infrequent subset that are incredibly important for maintaining our health. Uh, in this case, monocytes are a relatively low proportion of the bone marrow, something about 10%, uh, but they're something like 90% of the infiltrate into the brain uh, in, this, in this encephalitis model. And so even though they're small and even though the progenitors of the monocytes are low frequency, uh, it's very important that we're able to see them uh, on their own as single cells and see how they're changing to work out the best way we can interfere with this disease process. So kind of a follow to that, given the just the composition of the tissue you're looking at, the different types of cells that might be there, how do you decide on what areas of a tissue to, to image on IMC? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. I think even, you know, in our own approach to this early on, you kind of just want to image everything, you know, just sort of, you know, ab uh, ablate the entire tissue and then think about what comes up out the other end. 
but I don't think it's a very economic or a very pragmatic way of approaching this. I think what's important in the way we set up these assays is that we start by doing probably a just a simpler approach to imaging, you know, some kind of immunofluorescence microscopy. Um, you can figure out what areas matter, what areas uh, are the areas that have infiltration of immune cells. Uh, if you're looking at, for instance, um, tumors, which may be much larger areas, you can make decisions about, okay, you want to get representation of you know, the core of the tumor, of the margin, and of the healthy tissue surrounding it. Um, so you can use that kind of fluorescence approach to basically tile the entire thing. So you've got broad areas of coverage of very few markers, uh, and that allows you to define areas where you want to drill in with many more markers using IMC. Uh, at the moment, we tend to do this using serial section. So we take a cut of tissue, analyzing that, analyze that using immunofluorescence, figure out the areas we care about. On the next section, the very next cut, uh, a serial cut, uh, we can then take that and image it using IMC. Uh, we can do it a little bit differently, though. We can often do this on the same slide. Um, for instance, we have uh, some antibodies which are able to label fluorophores. So for IMC, for instance, we might have a metal label antibody that can label FITSI. So uh, what we do with the encephalitis model is we can take uh, a section of brain, we can stain it with a FITSI conjugated antibody against, say, NS1, figure out what areas of the brain are affected on a microscope, take the same section, stain it with a uh, metal conjugated antibody against FITSI, and then image the areas we care about on IMC on the very same section. So we have directly comparable immunofluorescence images and IMC images of the same brain, which uh, for us is very helpful. So how do you deal with the fact that individual regions of interest uh, can be highly variable even in, within the same slide when doing this? Yeah, this at the moment is a pretty significant challenge. Um, I think it, we're often used to suspension style cytometry where the I suppose differences between samples, they, they can be significant, but they're fairly, I would say, easy to manage. Um, with tissue sections, uh, there's just a lot of variability, a lot of heterogeneity that comes up for what is sometimes no apparent reason. Uh, levels of background binding, for instance, may change for reasons that aren't apparent and don't necessarily correlate with a specific batch or a specific day of processing or anything. I think the insight into the tissue and into the sample prep matters a lot in these situations. Uh, I think we can take it for granted sometimes, just, oh, well, you know, if it's positive for that, if the antibody is showing up, then it's positive for that antibody uh, on a particular cell. But I think uh, not thinking carefully about this, about the actual tissues, not manually looking at the images and making assessments about what's happening leads to those kinds of traps where we just assume that everything is fine. I think uh, the, these technologies and these an analytical approaches are you know, they're cool and they're, they're really, really impressive. And they give us the ability to, to learn a lot from these sections, but fundamentally it doesn't replace the work of the scientist and the investigator, the one who has to actually look at the things and make decisions about uh, both the outcome, but about the way that we need to be interpreting things and potential sources of uh, convolution. So I think the way to deal with that at the moment, the best way, I think, is for uh, the investigator to be a scientist, to do the work of looking and assessing, knowing something about what's happening to the samples and to the tissue and making assessments that way. Thank you. Do our current approaches to cell segmentation work well? If not, what about those approaches do you feel needs to change? Yeah, I think, I think our current approaches work okay, but they can definitely be improved upon. Um, there is, in fact, a whole sort of area of machine learning and deep learning, which has been developing approaches to cell segmentation over many, many years. Um, and so there is there is a wealth of kind of background there that can be drawn on. But fundamentally, those areas haven't been using multidimensional data like the type we generate with the IMC. And so it seems trivial, but it actually does change things. When you can look at, say, 30 antibodies simultaneously on a tissue section, you see that there are overlap, uh, overlapping areas of um, cells, which, you know, they, these change depending on what marker you're looking at. Sometimes because some markers are expressed in particular areas of a cell, and sometimes just because there are cells there that you weren't able to image before then. And so I think the current approaches work reasonably well. They get, they get the job done, 
But I think what we can start to do is draw on a lot of these machine and deep learning approaches to improve the way we do segmentation, um, both at uh, the level of like quality with which we segment. Uh, but I think very fundamentally, we need to adapt the way that we actually treat the what is now single cell data, knowing that we have these these overlapping uh, areas of cells where segmentation isn't perfect, um, and we need to adapt the way we actually handle that data and analyze it. So I think the segmentation can be improved um, using uh, a, a range of the existing tools in machine and deep learning, but I think the way we analyze the data needs to adapt as well. Given these different methods, what is the greatest source of variability in IMC assays? That is a difficult question. What is the greatest source of variability? I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot. One of the greatest, I think, which is probably not necessarily appreciated all that much is in the tissue preparation itself. Um, there can be a lot of variability in the way that we stain things, you know, slight differences in antibody concentrations. Uh, there can be some variability from, in how the machine works day to day. But I think fundamentally, if the tissues are prepared poorly, then that is the thing that generates the greatest, uh, generates the greatest heterogeneity between our samples. And I think fundamentally this is because either when we're preparing the tissue in terms of uh, embedding or fixing and embedding or uh, freezing, if that's not done in a way which is consistent and quality, then the entire tissue section is degraded to some extent, which obviously then doesn't matter how good our staining is, that's going to fundamentally affect what we can get out of that tissue section. Uh, but even the way we fix ahead of staining, uh, for instance, we know that the brain, for instance, uh, uh, tolerates acetone fixation in our frozen sections much less well than some of our lymph tissues do. And it actually starts to degrade uh, the tissue and in some cases will, will cause the brain section to fall off the slide uh, unless we treat it in a particular way. So there's, there are elements like that where very early on in the process, there is a key thing that will determine whether our tissue, tissue is good quality and not so variable or bad quality and highly variable. Thank you. Currently, most computational approaches work well for individual experiments, but not for repeating an analysis on new data sets or experiments where manual gating is often used. Are there ways of adapting computational workflows or incorporating new experiments and data sets? Yeah, I, I think I think there are ways of uh, adapting these approaches, and uh, there are a number of approaches out there which deal with sort of batch alignment or data integration. Uh, and the essential idea is that if you have marker expression sort of levels um, on cells, these might shift from experiment to experiment. And the approach like cytonorm that I mentioned uh, has a, a very key trick which allows you to use reference samples. So if you have a, uh, a sample which you're essentially using uh, separate aliquots of in different experiments, you know that that sample is biologically identical uh, in each experiment. And so you can infer that if you can identify the same subsets in each um, each of the runs, you can use them to basically create uh, the rules for alignment and apply those rules to the rest of the sample. Uh, we can do something very similar in IMC if we sort of, uh, I suppose, cleverly adapt the way that we think that, uh, think about that. So yeah, we can, I think, take the kinds of approaches that we use for data al uh, batch alignment and data integration to allow us to replicate an analysis in suspension data using classifiers. And I think if we are careful and a little bit clever about the way we ap apply those approaches to IMC, we can do something similar so that we can get sort of more consistent alignment of uh, data sets from uh, imaging data. And I think that'll help in terms of the reproducibility of that kind of analysis. Thank you very much. We've unfortunately reached the end of our time for questions today. I'd like to thank Dr. Thomas Ashurst of the Sydney Cytometry Facility located at the University of Sydney for taking the time to present to us this talk regarding the mapping of dynamic immunity using high dimensional imaging mass cytometry approaches. Any questions that were not addressed will be answered by email if able. This presentation was sponsored by Fluidime in partnership with Wiley's Current Protocols and will be available for on-demand viewing on the Current Protocols website at www.currentprotocols.com, the webinar section under resources. Thank you for attending.